Father in heaven, Lord, your people here are assembled today because we want to draw nearer to you, Lord, to the precious bleeding side of Christ. Lord, Lord, we ask today, Lord, that as we listen to the message, Lord, that you have today, we ask, Lord, that as they listen, that their hearts would be converted, Lord, their minds would be convicted, and that, and that, a, and that a resolve to obey will, will take place, Lord. And Lord, and Lord, even after they listen, Lord, uh, I pray, Lord, that you would give us all the strength to day by day be willing to, to continue on in a newfound resolve. Please bless us, Lord. We invite your presence in your spirit. Help me, Lord, as your mouthpiece today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Good morning. It is great to see you all today. You guys are, you guys are looking good. Oh, and I hope you're feeling good, too. Amen. And uh, if you're not, uh, please see me afterwards, and uh, I'll have a word of prayer with you. Amen. Amen. So today, I would like, I would like to ask if we can begin to pray for unity. One of the themes in the New Testament is unity within the body of Christ. Even declaring one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Now, I believe once we achieve unity as a denomination, then we can truly finish the work of Christ. Amen? Amen. Now, with the aim of unity, we can begin to solve the misunderstandings of our scriptural interpretations uh, and ignite the courage to make changes within the new light within our church services. Amen? Now, I, for one, particularly, um, really, really don't um, enjoy uh, the, the, the separations of uh, categories that we place on ourselves within this denomination. Conservative, conservative uh, churches, uh, uh, celebrational churches. You know, I believe that now the time has come for all Seventh-day Adventists to, to worship the Lord in spirit and truth. Now, this means that those who are sincere in their walk with God will have to make the effort to lovingly help our brethren unlearn a lot of popular scriptural errors and lovingly teach the old paths, amen? amen. And lovingly endorse the spirit of prophecy and lovingly encourage the use of natural remedies and embrace medical missionary work, amen? amen? And to lovingly, lovingly teach the loud cry messages of the four angels, amen? Now, therefore, today, brothers and sisters, I believe that, that I was sent to help contribute to equip you within your sincerity to reach our brethren and bring about unity. Particularly, I'm going to discuss how we can begin worship, how, how we can begin the process to worship and praise together to bring unity, to bring unity within our churches. You know, one of, the, one of the big dividers is the way that we worship God in the sanctuary. Some of us won't attend certain churches because of the worship style and vice versa. Some of them will say, oh, well, they're not, you know, 
uh, worshiping God enough. They're just there, sitting there. And some would say, oh, well, they're too, they're too wild. So, brothers and sisters, I believe that the time has come now for us to bridge the gap. And, we, and we're going to see it from the, from the Bible, amen? So, so, therefore, the name of this Bible study today is called Heavenly Praise. And a, and a central verse, an essential verses uh, for our study comes from Psalms 150. Now, now, why Psalms 150? Why Psalms 150? Well, because this particular chapter is the central verse as to why many of our churches experience a loss of membership. Some members will want to stick to the calmer, cons conservative worship style, while others want to change to a more animated, lively, li livelier service style. And, and as a result, and as a result of this, there are two types of SDA churches. The lively, celebrational churches, who view, the conserv who view conservative members as radical fanatics. And then there are the conservative churches who view the celebrational church, church members as nominal in name only. Brothers and sisters, honestly, this is a sad situation because we are, we worship one Lord, we have one faith, and we all experience one baptism in, in this denomination. And, and we are not to be despisers of each other. I say we are not to be despisers of each other. Amen? So I would say worship styles is a big deal for us to understand to bring about unity. Would, would you? Amen? So today, let's take a closer look to learn, once and for all, the methods, the method God prefers of his praises. Now, it's my personal tradition uh, with, with every study I give to start and end with Jesus. Amen? It's safe to do so. Why? Because Jesus is our example, brothers and sisters. He was the only one to live a sinless life, and he's the teacher and it's always safe and best to look first to Jesus. Would you say amen, brother? Amen. amen. So let's look at, let's look at Jesus' thoughts on church. Um, all right. So our first scripture comes from Matthew 21. Matthew 21, verses 12 and 13, and I also have it on the screen here. So Matthew 21, verses 12 to 13, and it says, And Jesus went into what? The temple of God. That's important. And cast, out, and cast out all of them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, and said unto them, It is written, My what? My house shall be called what? A house of prayer. Jesus said, it is written, my house should be called a house of prayer. So that's number one, Jesus' thoughts on church. That church, the temple of God, is a house of prayer. Amen. You with me? Now, something to point out here, Jesus went, now, now something to point out here, Jesus went to the temple and he called it a house of prayer. So now we need to understand what is prayer. And, and I just want to simply say that prayer is, the, is communication to God in heaven. But let's prove that. So let's look at, let's look at Luke chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. And then it says, I'm sorry, verse, uh, yes, verses 1 and 2. And it says, and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, 
one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said unto them, who said unto them? Jesus said unto them, he said what? When ye pray, say, our Father, which art in heaven. So, this right here proves that prayer is communication to God in heaven. What do you say? You say amen? Amen. You, you with me so far? Amen. So, now, we need to look at Jesus' behavior during prayer. I, I think that's, that's important, right? To, to know Jesus' behavior during prayer. Jesus is our example, so therefore we need to know how to behave when we pray, right? Right? So, we look at Matthew chapter 25. I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 11. Verse, starting at verse 25, and we'll skip to verse 29. It says, at that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father. There it is. He's communicating. He's praying to God. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid in, excuse me, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent and has revealed them unto babes. Verse 29. Now, here's Jesus' behavior during prayer. Take note of this. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, because he's our example, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. So we see in verse 29, he, excuse me, in verse 25, he starts off praying to God, but then in the midst of that prayer, he gives instructions to his disciples and to, and to, and to, and to us as, as Christians, you know, modern-day disciples, for us to have a certain demeanor, attitude, doing prayer. Now, what is meekness? What is, what is, what is a different way of, of, of saying meekness? In our, in, our, in, our, in our everyday language, do you, do you go around and say and use the word meek in your, in your everyday language? No? You'll say, you'll say humbleness. All right? Humbleness. Say, so I am humble and lowly in heart. Amen? All right. So, all right. So, so when Jesus goes into the house of prayer and he prays, he prays with humbleness and lowliness, gentleness of heart. This is Jesus, this is Jesus, this is Jesus example. Amen. Now, let's go to our primary verses. Psalms 150. Okay. So Psalms 150, this entire chapter, it's only six verses. Now it says, verse 1, it says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to the excellence of his greatness. Praise him with the sound of what? The trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery, with the psaltery and the harp. Praise him with the tremble and the, and what? And dance. Praise him with string instruments and organs. Praise him upon the what? Loud cymbals. Praise him upon the what? High sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise ye the Lord. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, quickly, who wrote these, this chapter? Who, who wrote this verse? David, right? So we know the Holy Spirit, but wrote it through David, right? Amen. So, question. What do we know about David? He was what? He had a heart for God. What else? You know, who, was, who was David? Go ahead, brother. He was a king. Yes. He was a warrior. Right? He was also a musician. He was a shepherd. Right? All right. So, um, now, we see here David in this chapter, he is uh, giving us uh, uh, instructions on how to praise God. Now, now, are there any teachers here? 
teachers, right? So a teacher gives instruction. And normally, a teacher will provide an example on how to uh, follow those instructions. Am I right? Right? Amen? So, so brothers and sisters, we'd like to praise God because the Bible actually provides a demonstration of how David lived these instructions for us. So, um, so what else do we know about David? We also know that David was Jewish, right? We know that David was Jewish. And what is something that all Jewish people, even to this day, love? What? He said, David, keep the Sabbath, yes. Anyone else? They love music? Okay, amen. They love the writings of Moses. Moses. They always point back to Moses. It's all about Moses, right? So David was, was no different. Uh, matter of fact, David, uh, he cherished the, the writings of Moses so much so that, that when he was about to die, he charged his successor, his son Solomon, to do the very exact same thing, to cherish the writings of Moses. Let's look at that. This is in 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now David, now the days of David drew nigh that he should what? That he should die. And he charged who? Solomon. Keep that in mind. He charged Solomon, his son, saying, verse 3, it says, And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways. To do what? Keep his statutes. And do what? Keep his commandments. And what else? And his judgments. And what else? As written in the law of what? Moses. So now normally when a person dies, when they are about to die, they want to get out the, the most important thing they have to say to those around them. They, whatever it is, that they feel is the, is, the, is the most important things for those to know behind them, that's, that's when they get it out and say it. Now, brothers and sisters, it's no, it's no coincidence that David, his last words to Solomon was to, was to look to the law written by Moses. Now, where is the law of Moses now? In, in, the, in the Bible, where, where can we find it? First of all, you know, where can we find the, the books that Moses, Moses wrote? You know, the, the first five, someone said the Old Testament, and what, what, what are those? Right, I, I, I can't hear you guys, speak up, speak up. Genesis, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, did, did I miss one? That's all five, right? Now, to me personally, no other book of Moses really relays God's laws like Leviticus does. That's my personal opinion. So, so now, brothers and sisters, let's find out what exactly is written in the law of Moses. Now, in Leviticus chapter 26, verse, verse 2, we could find one particular thing that that God had wrote, provided Moses for us. Now, we know Leviticus 26 as the, as the, as the, as the seven times chapter, amen? That's where, you know, the 2520, amen? Amen. So, so now, it says, it says in verse 2, this is the Lord speaking. He says, ye shall keep my Sabbaths and what? And reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord God. So, so now, quick question. What is reverence? Someone said respect. What else? Anyone else? Honor. Honor. Amen. All those things. Having a deep admiration. Treating something so, treating something delicate. You know, 
has anyone ever been to the Arlington Cemetery in, in Washington, D.C., and, and have seen the, the, the changing of the guard ceremony? Yeah. So, so you know, for, for those who are there, you know that, that they ask for you to reverence that, that ceremony taking place with silence, with silence, with silence and, and with calmness. And and with a and with a and with a, and with a deep respect to, to to treat that location and event as something sacred, amen. Now here's something to think about also concerning verse two of of of, uh, of this chapter. It says. It says, uh, uh, it, it says, "Ye shall keep my Sabbaths." And. And are we still to keep God's seventh day? Yes. So, so does this also mean that we are that we are to still reverence God's sanctuary too? Amen. Amen. Yes. So, so here's the extra question I like to throw out there: If we don't reverence His sanctuary, then could it be a form of not keeping the Sabbath? Something to consider. So David knew from the writings of Moses, from the law of Moses, how to reverence the sanctuary as it is revealed here. He knew something about sanctuary conduct. Now, let's see how David behaved on his way to church. Now, many of you know these verses by heart, but we're just, we're just going to provide it. So let's look at Psalms, chapter 122, verse 1. This is how David behaved on, the, on his way to church. He said, I was glad. I was what? Glad. I was glad when he said unto me, let's go where? Into the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. So this is David's attitude on his way to church, to the house of prayer. Okay? What else? David on his, on his way to church. In Psalms 100, verse 4, David said, enter his gates, talking about God's gates, enter his gates with what? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. And into his what? His courts with praise. So brothers and sisters, let me ask a question now. We're inside of a sanctuary, yes? Is there a gate in, in, inside of here? Where is, is the gate in, in, inside of this, this room right here? It's outside, right? It's, it's not in the sanctuary, right? Yes? Okay. All right. Great. So, however, when it comes, when it comes, so, so we saw that David, he, he was glad with the, at the idea of going to church. And, and when he got to the premises of the church ground, he entered it with, with, with thanksgiving and with praise. Now, now, how did David enter God's sanctuary? Let's see. This is Psalms chapter 5. This is David's own words now. Psalms chapter 5, and this is supposed to be verse 7. It's, 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 not, it's not provided on there, but you, you can find it. Psalms chapter 5, verse 7. David said, as for me, I will come into where? What do he say? I will come into thy house, talking to God, into the multitude of thy mercy, and in thy fear. Key word there, fear. I will worship towards thy holy temple. Now, um, I'm really not a, a, a big user of uh, Greek and, and Hebrew definitions. You know, I, uh, I feel that, you know, the Bible was, was, was written in English. It's supposed to be un, un understood in English. However, sometimes, you know, we have to pull, go, to, go a little deeper in, you know, to actually pull out those jewels a, every now and then. So, so the Hebrew word here in this verse for fear is uh, derived from the uh, concordance number. I'm sorry, it's uh, derived from the Hebrew word Yira, Yira, Yira. 
don't know if I'm saying it right, Yira. And, and you can find this in, in your concordance under number 3374. And, and the word that David used for fear means uh, fear of God, respect, reverence, reverence, piety. So David said, as for me, so, so we can read this verse again in Psalms chapter 5, verse 7, and it says, But as for me, I will come into thy house in a multitude of thy mercy, and in thy reverence I will worship towards thy holy temple. Am I, am I stressing this, brother, brother and sister? No? Amen. You, you, you still with me? Amen? How, how, how are you feeling? Feeling good? All right. Okay. Good. So, you know, um, I feel compelled to have a word of prayer. I'm looking at some sleepy faces out here, and, and, this, and this message is, is important for everyone to hear and to, and to, and to grasp because, because, because this is a message that you know, should not you know, just be left, left here, can, can contained here. My, my personal prayer is that you would take this and you would, and you would, and you would use it as your own, and you would, and you would teach it to others. Amen. That's the goal here. Amen. So let's have a let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we ask that you would rejuvenate us, Lord. Father, uh, the devil wants to uh, try to put a sleepy stupor over us, Lord. Uh, Lord, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus, Lord. Wake us up. Invigorate our minds. Create, generate in, in excitement for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, so now you may question. Now, so now someone, or you may question, and you may say, well, hold on. What about all those things that David wrote in Psalms 150? Right? Because, you know, I'm reading a verse to you that says that David, you know, reverenced the, the, the Lord. So, brother, brother August, in Psalms 150, talks about you know all these great praises you're supposed to give you know the, the Lord. So, so let's go back to Psalms 150. Now you will see on the slide here, Psalms 150. I put what David did in church question mark, and and it's a big question mark because I don't want you to to miss that a big bold red question mark. And so we can read these verses again. So Psalms 150, and it says, praise ye the Lord. Again, David's giving instructions. And then he says, praise God where? In his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. And then, the, and then it goes on to say, praise him for his mighty acts according to his excellent greatness. And then verse 3 it, 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 goes, it goes on to, to, to describe the, the, the kind of praise. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the psaltery in the heart. Praise him with the timbrel and the dance. See, it says dance. Praise him with the string instruments and the organ. Praise him with the loud cymbals, with the high-sounding cymbals. Now, here's something, brothers and sisters, I would like for us to notice closely here. Looking at verse 1. David began instructions with praise you the Lord. Then he further gave instructions of two locations of how to praise, I'm sorry, of, of where to praise the Lord. Two locations of where to praise the Lord. Praise God where? In his sanctuary, location one. Praise God, I'm sorry, praise him in where? In the firmament of his power. Second location. Would you agree? Okay. Okay, now, um, now is firmament a word? So, all right, so we, so, so we know what a sanctuary is, right? This, this, this church, right? So now, do we know what a firmament is? Is that, is, is that something in your, in your, in, in our, in our common, in our common everyday language to use the word firmament? When was, when was the last? Uh, raise your hand if you use firmament, the word firmament this, this week. No one, no one used the word firmament. I'm surprised. Not really. 
Now, brothers and sisters, if you take the time to go to your dictionary, you'll, you'll, you'll learn that firmament means open air. It's outside. All right? Okay? But let's confirm that from the Bible, okay? Okay, so let's look at Genesis chapter 1. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1, and we're going to start at verse 8, and we're going to look at three verses from Genesis chapter 1, because we want to prove that firmament and the sanctuary is not the same place. We want to prove that firmament is outside. So, Genesis chapter 1, verse 8, it says, And God, who? God. And God called what? The firmament, the firmament what? Heaven. Heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. Verse 14, skip down to verse 14, it says, And God said, Let there be what? Lights. Where? In the firmament. Where? Of, of the heaven, Right? To divide the day from the night. And let there be uh, uh, let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. Okay? So we know and from verse 8, God called the firmament heaven. And then we know from verse 14, God placed uh, uh, lights in, in, in uh, uh, lights in the, in the heaven. So now let's look at verse 20. He says, and God says, let the water bring forth. Uh, let the waters bring forth abundantly, the moving creatures that have life, and and the fowl and the what, and the fowl that they may do what, they may fly above where, the earth in what, the open firmament of heaven. Brothers and sisters, I present to you that firmament means open air. It means, in an other way of saying, outside. Amen. Outside. Amen? Amen? So, brothers and sisters, uh, it's, now it's time to investigate a little deeper of how David worshipped God. First in the firmament, then, I'm sorry, first in the sanctuary, then in the firmament. And let's learn if his conduct was the same, right? Because we want to we want to we want to understand Psalms 150. Okay? So, now we can read in 2 Samuel chapter 7. So 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 6 uh verse the, the verses I'm going to look at is uh, verse uh, 16 through 18. But, 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 for your, but, for your, but for your notes, you can, you can have uh, verses 1 through 19. We can see that, that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 1 through 19, we can see that David told Nathan the prophet, that he wanted to, and he, that he wanted to erect a, a building for God. And God told Nathan to to tell David that that it was a good thing for him to want to do so. But however, it was not his job to do it. God said, God said that David's son will be king, and he will make the building. Solomon. God also gave David some additional good news. He informed him that his namesake kingdom will forever be established. So, so that's the premises before, before verse 16. Now, brothers and sisters, I would like to ask, wouldn't that qualify as, as, as good news for, for, for David to hear, right? That, that his kingdom will, 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 will last forever, right? You know, and that would, and, and wouldn't that qualify as a as a great occasion to 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 to, to celebrate, to, to 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 go to church and to and to sing and to dance and, and to praise God with the lot with the high sounding cymbals and and with the loud music and, and with the and with the timbre of dance? Wouldn't that be a great occasion for David to do such thing to 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 invoke Psalms one fifty? 
I can't hear you. Yes, right? Surely, if God informed you about your future, you'll be happy to uh, you you'll be happy too. And when you and when you want to, to go to church and, and do a dance, no? <laughs> You know, and, and especially with David being being a musician, uh, I'm sure, you know, he uh, 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 possibly, you know, would, would, would you, you, you would think that, that David would, would want to possibly go to church and, and, uh, and uh, rock out for, for the Lord. But, but let's see uh, what David actually did. So now let's look at the screen here. So we see in 2 Samuel verse, chapter 7, verse 16 through 17, through, through 18, let's see what, what, what David actually did when he went to, to church. He said, uh, uh, let's, let's start with verse 16. It says, In thy house, and thy, this, is, this is Nathan, it said, In thy house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be, for, shall be established forever, according to all these words and according to all the, this vision. So did Nathan speak who? Spoke to David. Now, this is, this is how David reacted. Then, w- then went K- King David in and did what? Sat. Sat before the Lord. And he said, O oh Lord. He, he said, Who am I, O oh Lord God? Brothers and sisters, David went in he went to church with good news and he went there and he sat and he prayed. And he sat and he went there with, with, with good news. Mind you now, what did we read? I was glad when he said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Enter his gates and his courts with, with, with thanksgiving. But when he got to the Lord, he sat and he prayed. Somebody say Amen. Now, now, why did David do that? Because he remembered what was written in the law of Moses, to reverence my sanctuary. Amen. Amen. Now, someone, someone may say, well, you know, Brother August, you know, David went in and he sat, you know, uh, before the Lord. But Brother August, you may be putting you you may be putting too too much on it by, by, by saying that, that he that he sat and, and, and prayed. Someone someone may someone may be may be thinking that I that I'm putting too too much on this. But however, in the same chapter, let's look at verse twenty seven, and let's confirm that David went in and he sat and he prayed. And this is towards the end of his prayer. He says, "For thou." O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, has revealed to thy servant, saying, I will build thee in house. Therefore, hath thy servant found in his heart to do what? To pray this prayer unto thee. Now remember what David, who was on his deathbed, taught Solomon. He taught Solomon to obey all of God's rules. You see, brothers and sisters, David lived by God's rules. And it, and it resonated so much with Solomon in his old age, so much so that he wrote it down as wisdom for those to come and follow after him. Now, the spirit of prophecy tells us in uh, Patriarchs and Prophets that uh, Solomon, he wrote the book of Ecclesiastes as an as a old man. Solomon ruled in, in Israel for like 40 years. So, so towards the end of, of his life, he, he, he reflected on, on, on all the things that he'd done and, and the things that, that, that he was taught. And Solomon made it, made it a, a clear effort to include sanctuary conduct in, in Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, Solomon instructed his successors Keep thy foot when thy goest to the what? To the house of God. And be more ready to do what? To hear. 
than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they consider not that they do evil. Be not what? Rash. With what? With thy mouth. And let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou art upon earth. Therefore do what? Let your words be few. Brothers and sisters, doesn't this sound like a description of, of reverence? Amen. Amen. You can, you can say amen. Amen. Now, keep in mind, Solomon is, is the same purpose who wrote a couple of chapters earlier that, that there is a time and a place and a purpose for everything. Amen? Now, I'm sure he learned many things through his father, whether it was directly or indirectly. And one of those things, I'm sure, is, is having reverence for God's house and knowing the proper time the proper time and place to celebrate in happiness. Now, some may say, some may say, you may be thinking to yourself, or, 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 may, or may be saying to yourself, August, Brother August, King David, I remember distinctively, King David did dance before the Lord. What about that? David danced before the Lord. You, 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 you can't just, just tell me, oh, well, you know, you got to be calm and all, all this stuff. I remember David dancing before the Lord. What about that, Brother August? Any, anyone thinking that thought? Don't, don't, don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. Now, uh, let's go back to Psalms 150. Uh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Okay, so, sorry. So looking back at Psalms 150, verse 1, uh, verse 1 also tells us uh, that, re remember we learned that, 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 that there are two lo locations. One location is in the sanctuary, another location is in the firmament, outside, right? So, let's learn how David praised God in the open air. Now, 2 Samuel, same book, 2 Samuel, but instead of chapter 7, now we want to point to chapter 6. Okay, and, and see, and so it says, and so it says starting with uh, verse 12. Uh, yeah, yeah, starting with verse 12. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with what? with gladness. And David, what? Danced. David danced before the Lord with all his might and was girded with the linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with what? With shouting and with what? The sound of the trumpet. And the ark of the Lord came into the city of David. Now, brothers and sisters, here's your proof. Here's additional proof that David was doing this in the firmament. And so, uh, uh, and as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, uh, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through what? Through a window. She was inside, looking outside. Looked through a window and saw David doing what? Leaping and dancing before the Lord. Brothers and sisters, this was how David praised God in, in, in the firmament. This was how David applied verses 3 through 6 of, of Psalms 150 in the firmament. All that timbrel and, and loud dance and shouting and everything else was done outside. Amen. Amen. Is that clear, brothers and sisters? Amen. So, so brothers and sisters, this is where David danced. He was outside. So, so we can reread Psalms 150 and understand David's praise 
prescription to God. David's instructions to God, outside and inside. Psalms 150, verses 2 through 5, is not instructing us on how to praise God in the sanctuary. The Lord came today, brothers and sisters, to reveal to our hearts, to give us clear light, to begin to remove the rift so we all can worship God together in unity, celebrational churches and conservative churches. Amen? This is how we can remove the rift. One of the ways we can remove the rift. Amen? Aren't, aren't you glad? Amen? Amen. Now, now some may question, some may question you when you, when you, when, when you show them this. They may say, David wrote, declaring that we should all make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And, and in all honesty, church, family, we need to understand that the scriptures never contradict themselves. So if you were to look everywhere in the Bible where, where this command of make a joyful noise is given, you will find that, that it doesn't command us to do so in the house of God. Now, now we're not going to, uh, okay, I thought I had it here, sorry. Uh, now we now we're not going to look at all the verses, but it's but you can write write this in your notes. Chapters you you, you can find this this uh, this reference in uh, Psalms chapter. All these are from Psalms chapter sixty six, chapter eighty five, chapter ninety five, chapter ninety eight, and chapter one hundred in in a, in a book of Psalms, and you will find. And, and you won't find any details prescribing it to sanctuary conduct. Now, church family, I could go on and on about who, Kate, who, who King David is, but honestly, he didn't die for our sin. So, so he is, is not our, our example on, on how to live. Christ is, amen? So, so we need to look at Okay, there it was. Hmm, it was there anyway. So, so we need to look at Jesus as, as our example. We see in First, first Peter chapter 1, verses, 20, verses 21 and 22, it tells us that Jesus is our example. It says, for, for even unto hereto ye were called, because Christ, who suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow in his steps. Leaving us what? An example that ye should follow in his, that we should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was any guile found in his mouth. Amen? Amen. So, so, so let's be clear. Jesus is our example. So when people try to justify their behavior on what another sinful man did, our response should be, okay, well, what about Jesus? What did, what did, what did he do? You know? What did Jesus do? Now, now some may be saying, yes, that's right. Jesus is our example. And, and Jesus and, 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 and everything, Jesus is our example. And everything up to this point has been from the Old Testament. However, Jesus is the New Testament, they may say. And those, and those Old Testament ways don't apply to us. So let's look and see what Jesus' example left for us within the New Testament. We'll see, first of all, uh, we'll see that, we'll see from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 5, starting at, at verse 5, and we're going to skip down to verse 10. It says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made, what? A high priest. But that, but he that said unto him, un, unto him, Thou art my son; today I have begotten thee. Verse ten it says, "Called of God, called of God, a high priest." So, brothers and sisters, we need to go back, and we and we saw earlier who David was. That he was a king. He was a warrior. He was he was, he was all all of these things. And, and now, 
We look to Jesus, and now we need to learn who, who Jesus is. You know, We know that he's our Lord and Savior, but what else? And so we see here from these verses that Jesus is called a high priest. Jesus is the high priest. All right? So, so where is Jesus as high priest now? We, we, we need to ask. We, we need to learn. In Hebrews chapter 8, starting with verse 1, it says, Now, the things which ye have spoken, this is the Son, which we have what? Such an high priest. Who's the high priest? Christ, Jesus, who is set on the right hand of the throne of God in, in the heavens. Amen? All right. So, so we can see here that Jesus, uh, uh, I'm sorry, look at verse 2. He says, a minister of the sanctuary. Because the question is, where is Jesus as high priest? So Jesus, as a minister of the sanctuary, of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. So we learned that, number one, Jesus is the high priest. And now we saw that Jesus uh, uh, is, is, is the high priest in the, in, the, in the heavenly sanctuary. Okay, so now, what is Jesus doing in the heavenly sanctuary as high priest? Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, God who at sundry times and in divers, and in divers manners spake in the times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath, hath, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power and excuse me, when he had by himself purged our sins, what did he do? Sat down. So Jesus is in heaven as high priest. He's, in, he's, he's ministering in the sanctuary and he's sitting down on the right hand of the, of, of the majesty of, of heaven. So So again, uh, uh, in this in this in the same chapter of uh, Hebrews chapter one, uh, if you would, okay. So, so just like King David, Jesus, Jesus went to the sanctuary, and he and he sat down. Now, mind you, now just like King David, Jesus. Was, was happy while in the sanctuary, while going to the sanctuary. Let's look at that. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verses uh, 9 and 13. It says, it says, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, hath what? Anointed, anointed thee with what? With the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Jesus was anointed with the, with the oil of gladness above, uh, above thy fellows. But, verse, verse 13, it says, But to which of the angels he said at any time, Do what? Sit at my right hand until I make thy enemies a footstool. So now, brothers and sisters, understand. Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness, extreme happiness, above anyone else. Jesus had any and every above reason to go to the sanctuary and, and do what some may say, you know, catch the, catch the Holy Spirit, catch the Holy Ghost. But he went to the sanctuary with extreme gladness and he sat at the right hand of God. Brothers and sisters, I would like to present to you that even Jesus displays reverence in the sanctuary. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, what is Jesus doing while he's sitting in the sanctuary? What is he doing? Any? 
Anyone know? Say it, say it, say it loud. Interceding for us. Let's prove that. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. What is Jesus doing while sitting in the sanctuary? It says, he, I'm sorry, who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God. Okay? Who also what? Maketh intercession for us. So brothers and sisters, let's, let's think about this for a sec. Jesus was anointed with the oil of gladness. And he still went into the sanctuary and he sat down. And, and while he's there, he's not thinking about himself. He starts interceding for us. Wow. Wow. He's not thinking about himself. He's interceding for us. Does anyone know what interceding means? He's praying. So Jesus is in the sanctuary. He's in the church praying for other people. Since Jesus is our example, this means that when we go to church, we need to spend some time in the sanctuary, praying for other people. Amen? Praying for other people too. Someone may say to themselves, well, Jesus is a priest, and it's the job of, of a priest to, to pray for others. Some may think, well, I'm not a priest. Uh, I'm not a priest. Uh, um, um, you know, not to... But brothers and sisters, we, we need to be aware that God views us as Christian, as a nation of priests. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's prove that, though. Let's prove that. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Are you, are you, you still with me, brothers and sisters? Amen? Amen. Okay. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, but ye are, a ch or what? A chosen generation. A what? A royal priesthood. A chosen generation. A royal priesthood. You're a priest. Amen. Amen. A holy nation. A peculiar people. That ye should show forth what? Praises. Hmm. A priest show forth praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen? So, brothers and sisters, it is our duty, I would like to say, it is our duty when we are the, the sanctuary to reverence it as a house of prayer and to say prayers for others. Let me say it again. When we are in a sanctuary, it is our duty to reverence it, to reverence it as a house of prayer and to say prayers for others. Understand, this is how God wants us to give him praise in his sanctuary. What does it say? That ye shall show forth praises. That ye shall show forth praises. This is the kind of praise that God wants in his sanctuary. Amen? This is how God wants us to come to church. Now, so we need to understand what is the essential job of a priest. The essential job of a priest is to pray for others. It's to pray for other people. Church family, this is how God is telling us how to give them praise. It's not about going to church and singing your heart out. Yes, we could make a joyful noise all we want in our cars, in the shower, when, we, when we're outside, uh, where, wherever else. But in his, when, when we come into his sanctuary, it is to be reverenced with, with meek and lowly of heart giving prayer. Not only just for ourselves, but for others. Amen? Amen. This 
is how we are to show forth praises. Praise God. Now, God says in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 28, this is what God wants. He says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they may be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And then he emphasizes here in verse 19, if ye be willing, after we come, after we come in, re in reason, if ye be willing, after, after, after you pray and after, and, after, and after God gives you his, his response, because prayer is communication to God. So when you pray, so when you come to the sanctuary, you pray to God, God, God gives his response through his, through his manservant at the, at, the, at the pulpit. And then he says, if you are willing and obedient to what God has responded back to you from the pulpit, ye shall be, uh, if you're willing and obedient, ye shall eat good of the land. Now, now to reason with another person involves communication. In fact, persuasive communication. You praying to God and him speaking back to you. Amen. So you see here, so here's something that we need to begin to understand. God is the one who is being worshipped. And since, and since that is the case, we have to worship him in a manner which he prefers. Amen? And not in a way that, not in a way that we want. Can we, do we know anybody who, in, in, in an example of that, who, who wanted to worship God in, in, in a way that, that that, 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 that he wanted and not the way that, that, that God wanted? Someone said Saul. Another one said Cain. I was thinking Cain. Saul too. Amen. Or um, so we have to worship God in a, in a way that you know, he wants. Not in our own ways or in, an, or in the ways that we, that we used to do when we were in those first day churches, not looking back to those first day ways that of, of, of how we used to, 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 to praise God. Remember Lot's wife? She looked back. She looked back. So God says to reverence his sanctuary, to call and treat his house as a place of prayer. Brethren, it is our duty to give God exactly what he wants uh, uh, as, he in, as he instructed us, not to worship God in the same manner as the heathens. Let's look at that in Deuteronomy chapter 12. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, we have to give God what he wants. And what does God want? In Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 30 through 32, uh, we'll look at uh, 30, 30 to 31. It says, And take heed to yourselves, that ye are not ensnared to follow them. After after they are destroyed from, from, from before you, and that ye do not inquire of their gods, saying, what? How did these nations do what? Serve their gods. I will also do likewise. And then he goes on to emphasize, and he says, you shall not worship the Lord your God in that way. Brothers and sisters, it's not about cultural preferences either. It's about your prayers. The time has come for us to truly begin to identify ourselves every time as, 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 as who we, we really are. If God has made all things new, then your culture is not derived from any location on this earth. If God has made all things new, well, then your culture is not derived from any location on this earth. You're no longer from California or from the South or, 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 from, New or, or from New York. You're no longer an, an American, Belizean, 
Jamaican or, 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 or Mexican. You're no longer a, a Libra, a Leo, a Taurus. You are now a Christian. And you, and you need to, and, and, and you need to every time identify yourself as that. I'm not a Libra. I'm a Christian. I'm not a, I'm not a black man. I'm a Christ man. Amen. Amen. So this means that, that a change in our lifestyle, I'm sorry, that a change in our styles of worship in the sanctuary must change as well. Brethren, it's not about trying to take away your culture. Honestly, brothers and sisters, our culture is sinful. Our culture is sinful. So why hold on to something that, 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 that rusts out, that, 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 that moths where we eat up? Or, or a place that will, that will be destroyed with fire and brimstone? You know, I'm from L.A. I don't, I don't care about L.A. I'm looking to, I'm, I'm representing New Jerusalem. Amen? Amen. 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 God called us pilgrims on, on, on this earth. Amen? So why, don't, so why hold on to a worship style that, that God doesn't want? You know, I could point out, I could also point out too, that in, that in many churches, the musicians that are playing there are, are not even members there. When, when a, and, and, and normally when, when, when a sermon takes place, uh, the, the, the musicians disappear only to resurface during the time of the, of the appeal. Has, has, any, has, has anyone else observed that? You know, I know, I know personally Adventist uh, musicians who play for Sunday churches. You see, brothers and sisters, for them, it's all about a paycheck. It's not about ministering. It's, it's not about ministering th through their songs. So when we do it as Adventists, are we breaking the Sabbath? Because we're having these musicians work for us? I think so. You know, uh, 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 a couple of things I would, I would say about David. He stuck to the prescribed methods. All who were a part of the service of God were Levites. From the priests, from the priests to the musicians. They were all Levites. In other words, they were all church members. Amen? Amen, sister? See, and you can read, and you can, you can read this in, 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 in 1 Chronicles 15, that same event where David is bringing up the, the, the Ark of God. You'll find that, that, that everyone involved in, in that service were all Levites. They were all consecrated. Meaning they all, meaning they all perform the communion, the foot washing. They 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 ate the bread and they and they drank the wine. They were all members of the body of the Christ that they performed for. It was service to God and not service to an employer. So. So so I would like to employ and implore any church. Who, who have such types of musicians, give them an ultimatum. Give, give them an ultimatum. Either, 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 either you play for us because you want to worship God or you, don't, or you don't play at all. No more paycheck. You come here, you come here for service for God, not because of your paycheck. Amen? Amen. Amen. And, and here's something that the spirit of prophecy says, says about, about that, consecration. It says, display, this is from, from uh, evangelism, book of evangelism, page, uh, uh, page uh, 510, paragraph 1. Evangelism, 510. It says, display is not religion nor sanctification. There is nothing more offensive. There is nothing more offensive in God's sight than the display of instrumental music when those taking part are not consecrated, 
are not making melody in their hearts to the Lord. Like David again, when he played for, for King Saul, how did David play? He played as a minister of music for him. Yes? Yes. To drive away the, the, the evil spirits. So, so when we have non-members ministering to us as well, are they playing to drive away evil spirits? Keep in mind that those who were not Levites, God's appointed ministers, were not allowed to participate in the sanctuary service. Amen? Church family, let's, let's reconsider just how to reverence God's sanctuary. Now that we know better from this point on, we can do better. Amen? Amen. See, it's time for us to teach the four angels' message of Revelation 14 and, and 18 in, in every practical way uh, according to, to, to our lives. The first angel talks us, talk, talk, tells us to fear God and give glory to him. And today we're learning to do so uh, uh, by, and today we're learning how to do so by learning his, his prescribed way in sanctuary conduct. Amen? Which leads us to the remaining angels telling us to come out of Babylon and not to, and, and not to worship God in their ways. This means, brothers and sisters, that we must not only take the Christian out of Babylon, but also Babylon out of the Christian. We must not only take the Christian out of Babylon, but Babylon out of the Christian. God told ancient Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt. Therefore, no turning back. No returning to that way of style of worship, nor, nor look at your new, at, nor look at your new neighbors and emulate their ways. He says, "You are not to worship the Lord your God in that way." Amen. Yeah. So when it comes to songs within the church, again, it's safe to do always what Jesus did. Amen. Yeah. And how? Did Jesus sing? We'll see here. Jesus in song. Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. Looking at verse 29. And we're going to look at, uh, the screen says verse 29 through 33, but uh, we're just going to look at 29 and 30. It says, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And then he went on to say, and then, I'm sorry, and when they had what? Sung a hymn. They went into the Mount of Olives. What kind of songs did, did, did Jesus sing? Hymns. So brothers and sisters, it's safe. To, to, to sing hymns. Amen. If, if, you, if, if, you, if, if, if you doubt any other song being, being, being played or, or sung, you can count on hymns because Jesus did it. Amen. 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 So, so, so what's the purpose of, 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 of songs now? The purpose of songs. Uh, Holy Spirit tells us through Paul, in the, in the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 15, it says, it says, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which ye are also called in what? In one body. And be ye what? Thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. First of all, where is the word of Christ found? In the Bible, right? Okay, so let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in where? In what? Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It's not a coincidence that God points out 
we are to be called one body. And, and then instructs us to teach and to utilize psalms and hymns and spiritual songs for unification. Also to keep us away, also to keep us from wandering away from him. You see, it's sad. It's sad that our, that our young can sing verbatim songs from the radio, but they can't quote verbatim uh, a, a, a verse from the, from, from the Bible. You see, God intended us to learn and to spiritually grow from the way that we sing. God intended us to learn and to spiritually grow from the way that we sing. We are a nation of priests, and we are to reverence God in a sanctuary to pray for others, to teach Christ's words and admonish, and admonish each other in psalms, in hymns, and spiritual songs. Here's what the Spirit of Prophecy says about that. In Evangelism, the book of Evangelism, uh, page 499. Page 499, it says, Even in the morning, join with your children in God's worship, reading his word and singing his praise. Teach them to repeat what? God's law concerning the commandments. The Israelites were instructed, Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, when thou walkest by thy way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So red words, get this. Accordingly, Moses directed the Israelites to set the words of the law to what? To music. Wow, the older children played on the instruments. The younger ones marched, singing in concert the song of God's commandments. In later years, get this part too, in later years, they retained in their minds the words of what? Of the law which they learned during childhood. Because they learned it through music. One of the ways they learned it through, through music. It goes on to say, uh, this is uh, the next page in, in, in the book of evangelism, page 500. It says, it was essential for Moses to embody what? The commandment and sacred song, so that, so that as they march in the wilderness, the children can learn to sing the law verse by verse. How essential it is to teach our children God's word. Let us come up to the help of the Lord, instructing our children uh, to keep the commandments to the letter. Let us do everything in our power to make music in our home that God may come in. Amen? Amen. Now, now going back to David, so, you know what? I want to give you guys a quick example of of how, of, of a hymn, a hymn that my family sung last night that actually uh, applies to this. This hymn is called Holy Day, Jehovah's Rest. A anyone know it? Amen. You know, Holy Day, Jehovah's Rest, of creation's weeks the best. Last of all, the chosen seven, blessed to man, t'was was given. Verse, uh, verse two, it says, first six days his work was done. Then the Sabbath was begun. Thus he blessed the seventh day. Thus in resting we obey. Thous verse 3, it says, thousands and, get this verse, thousands have his plan reversed, resting now upon the first. Search the book and you shall know. There's no scripture tells them so. Verse 4, it says, all who speak the truth must say, it was man, and we all know who that man is, who changed the day. In God's word, no change appears through the whole 6,000 years. Verse 5, it says, Thus I searched, and when I saw only one great Sabbath law, thus I hastened to obey, to obey. Plainly, t'was the only way. 
Welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad we have his presence blessed. Tis the great Jehovah's rest. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, uh, just to touch back uh, on, on David for a little bit, we're, uh, we're coming to a close. Let's look at how David played his, his music. Now, now we want to talk about how to play music, and let's look at how David himself played music. This is uh, 1 Samuel chapter 16. And, and there's something particular in this verse I would, I would like uh, for us to notice here. It says, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 23. It says, and it came to pass when what? The evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took an harp and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well. And the evil, the what kind of spirit? The good spirit? The evil spirit departed from him. So, brothers, this is, it's not coincidental here that, that God gave us a specific musical instrument in this verse. A harp. Now, question: What kind of sound? What kind of what 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 kind of melody does a does a harp pr produce? A soft, a soft sound, right? A soft, subdued sound, right? And brothers and sisters, it's no mistake that that it says that the evil spirit was driven away from Saul after the soft and subdued music was, was played. So, we know that light cannot mix with darkness. Therefore, wherever there are angels, demons cannot be present. We see, and we can see from, from a certain kind of music, we can see that a certain kind of music can remove demons or invite angels. W would you agree? Now, let's prove that from the spirit of prophecy. Uh, here's what the, the, the spirit of prophecy ha has to say uh, upon this topic. This is from Evangelism, Book of, of Evangelism, uh, page uh, 510. It says, great improvement can be made in singing. Some that think that the louder they sing, the more music they make, but noise is not music. God singing is the sound. God singing is, excuse me, I, I saw good and, and, I, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I and I put God. God is good. Amen? Amen. Good singing is like what? The music of birds, subdued and melodious. Goes on to say, uh, this is from Pastoral Ministries. Uh, page uh, 178, verse 2, paragraph 2, sorry. It says, worship music must be, talking about good singing, worship music must be what? Cheerful, yet solemn. Those who make singing part of divine worship should select what? Hymns, those beautiful hymns, with with music ap appropriate to the occasion. Red words, not funeral notes, but cheerful yet solemn melodies. The voice, the voice can and should be modulated, softened, and subdued. Amen? It goes on to say a little bit more about good singing. It says this, in some of our churches, I have heard solos that were all together unsuitable for the service of the Lord's house. This is from, excuse me, this is from Evangelism, page 510, paragraph 5. It says, in some of our churches, I have heard solos that were all together unsuitable for the service of the Lord's house. The long, what? The long, drawn out, notes 
and the peculiar common, uh, I'm sorry, and peculiar sounds common and common and operatic singing are not what? Pleasing to angels. They, talking about angels, they delight to hear the simple songs of praise sung in the natural tongue. The songs in which every word is uttered clearly in a musical tone are the songs that they join us in singing. Amen? They take up the refrain that is sung from the heart within the spirit and with understanding. Brothers and sisters, can we, I'd like to ask a favor, can we at this time, for those watching on, on, online, can we demonstrate one of these kinds, one, one of these types of songs? Or are, you, or, or, are we willing, you willing to do that? Amen, amen. So, so we see that, that, that there are, you know, are, that, there, that there is a, a, a certain kind of music that can remove me and, and a certain kind of music that also can, can invite demons. So, so, so brothers and sisters, as we, as we come uh, uh, towards the end, you know, I would, I would really, I would really like for us uh, to to really just have a have a good under understanding here, uh, specifically, you know, how how we are in the in the last days, uh, you know, what what not you know to to have as well, you know, I have a few more slides and and we're and we're done. So, so, so just before the uh, close of, of, of probation, the uh, spirit of prophecy gives us, uh, tells us what, what is going to take place before the close of probation. This is in uh, a last day events, uh, taken from uh, page one, 159, paragraph one. This is not so good singing. It says, these things, that you have described taking place in Indiana. The Lord has showed me what would take place just before the close of probation. Every uncouth thing would be demonstrated. There would be shouting with drums, music, and dancing. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make the right decision. Brothers and sisters, there's no coincidence in this paragraph here. It actually, you notice a specific instrument named the drums. The drums. Just as we saw in the Bible how David played the harp, it was specifically pointed out what he played to, to remove the demons. Now we see a, a, a specific instrument that that demons enjoy, that that is that is not a, a part of God's spirit. Now, and 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 how do I know? Well, the well, the young evangelist Daniel really in his uh, in, in his in, in his uh, um, uh, uh, help nugget supplied us with a uh, 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 Second Timothy chapter. I'm sorry, Second Timothy chapter one, verses uh, verse seven. He says, "For God has not given us." A spirit of fear, but of power, uh, but of love, and of what? And of sound mind. So, so if God gives us a spirit of sound mind, but however, uh, uh, when his music is played, you know, they cannot be trusted to, to make the, the, the right decision. When this when, when it's, when it's, when it's particular instrument is played, well then, well then, you know what? We should we should not, you know, associate the playing of this instrument with the spirit of God, because it contributes towards making the making us irrational beings and confused. It goes on to say. It goes on to say in, in the next paragraph of of the of, of the same page, Latter Day Saints, page page one fifty nine. It says. A bedlam of noise shocks the senses and perverts that which 
which if, if conducted aright, might be a blessing. The powers of what? Satanic agencies blend in with the din and the noise to have a carnival. And this is termed the Holy Spirit's working. Those in which have been in the past will be in the future. Satan will make music a snare by the way in which it is conducted. Goes on to say again, same page, third paragraph. It says, let no place be given to strange exercising, which really take the mind away from the deep moving, movings of the Holy Spirit. God's work is ever characterized by what? Calmness. By calmness and what? Dignity. Dignity. Amen. Consider what Jesus wrote through Paul, what he, what, what he given us in, in the Bible in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. It says, Jesus said through Paul, he said, these things I write unto thee, unto you and I, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry, if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou ought to behave thyself in the house of God. Amen? These things he write unto us so that we will know, just in case, if, if Jesus is long in, in his tarrying, how we are to, to behave in, in the house of God. Amen. Remember, what God said, come, let us reason together. He says, if you are willing and obedient, we will eat good. Brothers and sisters, I hope today you are willing and obedient. You know, God says that his house is a house of prayer. Yet, Christians spend the least amount of time in church praying. You know, I'm certain that if you were to do a comparison of how time, of how much time is, is spent in church singing to praying, you'll find that praying is the shortest. Now, now isn't that something? To be called the house of something and to find the least amount of it in it, it there. You know, you'll find music in a, in a house of blues. You'll find pancakes in a house of pancakes. <laughs> but, but what about the house of prayer? You'll find it to be a house of concerts, a house of entertainment, a house, unfortunately, a house of gossip, but not a house of prayer. God says that we are a nation of priests, and a priest's essential job, the, 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 the rule number one of a priest is to pray for others. In fact, for us as priests, not, not to do so, not to pray for others, is considered a sin against the Lord. It's considered a sin against the Lord. Let me prove that to you. 1 Samuel chapter 12, verses uh, 22 and 23. He says, for the, Lord, for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. Because it had pleased the Lord to make you his people. He's talking to, to you and I. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. Did you get that? Or did you miss it? Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord and ceasing to pray for you. Brothers and sisters, when, when we come to church and we don't pray for others, and we don't spend the, the, the most time in church praying for others, according to this, it is a sin. So, so surely, brothers and sisters, my appeal, you have someone you need to be praying for that possibly that unbelieving spouse, that unbelieving sibling, 
that unbelieving child. Surely you have someone you need to be praying for. That stiff-necked relative, those friends who see all your social media posts about the Lord, your, your, your YouTube videos that you share, the uh, spirit of prophecy quotes that you, that, you, that, that you post online, and yet still refuse to believe, surely you have somebody, someone you need to be praying for. Someone, possibly that former Ad Adventist friend, that Bible study contact, your brothers, or, or possibly your brothers or your sisters within your own church. So Self-supported or, or, or conference. So-called radical or, 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 or nominal. Surely you, have to, surely you have someone you need to be praying for. Brothers and sisters, it is our duty to pray for others when we come into his sanctuary. God calls his house of house of prayer, and we need to spend the most time in it praying for others. So here's where, so here's where my, my, my message ends. I would like to do something different. Uh, I would like for us to take you know, maybe five minutes or so, or assemble, uh, assemble ourselves in groups of three and four, and, and spend time praying.